now forever It picked me up, turned me around It set my feet on solid ground I'm yours now forever And nothing's gonna hold me back Oh, nothing's gonna hold me back Oh, nothing's gonna hold me back My chains fell off, my heart was free I'm alive to live for you I'm alive to live for you Amazing love, how can it be? Cause you gave everything for me You gave everything Wash my sin and shame away. This lady is clean, a brand new day. I'm free now forever. Now boldly I approach your throne to claim this crown through Christ my own. I'm yours now forever. And nothing's gonna hold me back. Oh, nothing's gonna hold me back. Oh, nothing's gonna hold me back My chains fell off, my heart was free I'm alive to live for you I'm alive to live for you Amazing love, how can it be? You gave everything for me
morning church hallelujah I want you to think about this line here in this song this is true for us all this morning this line says the enemy is under your feet come on we are free amen come on it says death has been defeated by love, you overcome. I want you to know you came in here this morning with the debt already paid, with freedom already at your feet. All we got to do is step into it as a church this morning. Can we sing that again? As we get into worship, can we sing that? The enemy is under your feet. We are free. We are free. Death has been defeated. Hallelujah. Death, Death has been defeated by love. You overcome. You overcome. The enemy is under your feet. The enemy is under your feet. We are free. We are free. Death has been defeated. Death has been Defeated by love, you overcome, you overcome. The enemy is under your feet. We are free, we are free. Death has been defeated by love. For the love poured out for the price of freedom. Let the whole earth sing, hear the praises rising. We stand in awe of what you've done for us at the cross, hope of the world. 
calling us home with arms out wide to know you forever to love you forever you are our everything our sin erased we're forgiven you may overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice I hold on to what is true though I cannot see if the storms of life they come and the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will be
upon me, staying desperate for you, God, staying humble at your feet. I will lift these hands and pray. enter in together this morning can you say that that this moment this time right here that you are completely his because what he's done we can be reminded of this morning he came down and did what only he could do to set us all free and I want to remind you, you are free this morning. You are. You're going to be reminded of that all day long today. Because the goal or when you leave here is to be completely different from whence you came in. And that's why we gather as a church, because we're all in the same boat here. None of us perfect. All of us going through things. But we have this hope, and it's true, and we can stand on it. That Jesus came and lived a perfect life, gave himself up for all of us, so that when we come to him wholly and completely, we have freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's be his this morning. Amen. Let's be his. We're just going to continue to worship, and we take a time in, or in our morning service to where we just come up and 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 we just give back to God through tithes and offering. And the music's going to keep on playing. And there's a basket here. There's baskets all around. The ushers will help you find them. I'm just going to pray. And then you can just get up and go find the nearest basket just to, to or to give your offering or as worship unto God. Amen. Let's, or let's enter in together. Father God, we come and say thank you for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do for us. Father, as we give to you, as we give back to you, Father. Oh, Lord. God, we pray that it can be used to see people come to you. God, let it be worship unto you. Let it be our offering to you, to a God that's worthy of it all. Father, we praise you and we thank you for all that you're doing. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and make your way up if you can. This Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low. I sing out and remind my soul. Sunday morning, we get some prayer needs up on the screen, and we're just going to kind of position ourselves. We believe it as a church that part of gathering together is to pray with one another. And we have needs in this church. We have loved ones that have been lost, and we want to lift up or these people as the Holy Spirit leads you. We're just going to take a moment with the piano playing, let the Holy Spirit or lead you to one of these names, and we're going to pray together. Amen. So let's enter in. Bow your head, get in a prayer position, however that you feel. Let's just take a moment as a family of God and let's enter in. Come on. Just lift up your voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Father, we come together, Father, for these needs in our church family. God, we pray for those, for the Link family, God, for the Butler family, for the May family as they have lost loved ones, God, dear ones to them. God, we pray that your peace and your comfort right now in the name of Jesus will invade their life, God. Father, we pray for those with physical needs, those going through cancer, God, those sick, Father. Right now, in Jesus' name, we know and we stand on it that, that by your stripes we are healed and we pray for healing for those right now, God. Father, we pray for those, Father, who just need salvation. They need to know you, God, the way that some of us in here know you. God, we pray through your Holy Spirit, reveal yourself in a mighty way. And God, we come together knowing that you have all we need. Lord, do a work in these needs, God. Let them become testimonies that shout out for generations of who you are. God, we praise you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I know coming off of a time like prayer, I, I, I just want you to know that we're going to have fun today. For those two of you that will join me, I bless, God bless you. We are going to have fun. I think we forget, or sometimes, that being a family of God, being a church, it's, it's fun. Wow. Let me start over. We're going to have a horrible time. Because being a Christian, is, it's hard. No, come on. It is hard, but this is fun. Following God, following Jesus, having the Holy Spirit in your life, it's a fun way to live. I say that because I encourage you and I, I, I invite you to laugh today. If not, I will be the only one laughing. And that is awkward. So at least humor me 
And let me move beyond my awkwardness and laugh. I'm going to show a video. Today we're going to be talking about resolve. We're, we're approaching a season where, you know, we like to think about new things, right? 2013 is closing down really quick. We have 2014 coming. And all of us, I don't care who you are, in some way, shape, or form, you think, you know what? I hope next year is better than this year. I hope there's change. I hope something is different. Well, we're going to have fun with that today and look in the, in the Word of God about, about some really important things that have to do with change, about, how, about, about becoming new. But we're going to dim the lights here, and I have this, this, this video that will kind of help us look at how we conquer resolve. Jeff Nill. Christian Karate Kaboom! This week, Conquering Resolve! Hello, my name is Jeff Neal, and that's how I've spent most of my life, doing Neal, not a zilch, zippo, but that's about to change. Last year I made a resolution that I would make myself the ultimate machine. You and your little friend want some sandwiches? I'm 42, Mom! Leave me alone! Jeffrey, it's chilly out there! I'm wearing my karate gi! As I was saying, I made a resolution that I would make myself the ultimate machine in body, mind, and soul. And to prove that I've accomplished my resolution, I'm going to karate chop these bricks. There are three things a person must have to conquer his resolutions. Resolve, obviously, discipline, and commitment. The first thing, resolve. Numbers 320 says that if a man makes an oath to himself, he must keep that oath. That is true resolve, my friend. That's true resolve, sticking to your commitment, no matter what life brings you, even when things heat up. Next, next is discipline. Karate has taught me a whole heap of discipline, and the Bible teaches discipline through wisdom. In this next scene you're about to watch, some people might perceive it as weakness or a lack of discipline. However, in all actuality, it is not. It is a practice in the ancient art of discipline through prudence. Therefore, as you're watching it, please keep in mind the words of Proverbs 22.3 that says that a prudent man sees danger and hides himself, but a simple man goes on and suffers for it. There's, um, there's four. I thought we were doing three. You said you wanted Let's do three. Can you take that off? Thank you. <sighs> Did we say three or two? You said four. I think I meant counting the bricks on the ground. There would be four. We're going to do this. Commitment is the essence of true Christian living. It produces champions in the face of adversity, even when adversity comes at you from all sides. Adversity may come even from those closest to you. At that time, you must choose commitment, even if it means committing to undo everything. What, what are you doing? No, hey, hey, no, this is mine. I'm gonna do this. Yes, I am. Yes, this is my. Oh, look at there. Look what you did, resolution ruiner. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Mom made me a sandwich! Like that's a funny example of resolve, right? We're all coming to a time, and I don't know if, if you have them. I saw one poll that said 75% of the people by 
the first of November had resolutions already. So I don't know, if, or, or like if you do that, but a lot of us look back at this last year and think, you know what, man, I wish I could do something a little bit different. I wish I could change. You know, there's something, or, or we all know ourselves, I hope, and so we you know we, 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 or we see or where we lack and where we're strong. We think, okay, you know what, 2013 was this or that, and, and, and I want this to be different. I was or looking at New Year's um, um, or resolutions, and I came across this definition of what a resolution is supposed to be. A resolution is supposed to be a firm, dis, or a firm decision to do or not do something. Okay, it's the action of solving a problem, dispute, or contentious matter. That's what a resolution is supposed to be. So when I was studying, I came across some, some funny things about New Year's. And so I have a few images here, Jacob, if you can cue, or, or the first one, about some funny things that you might hear on New Year's. This one, I can't believe it's been a year since I didn't become a better person. Some of us might relate to, to that one, or go to, or, or the next one. My New Year's resolution is to lose just enough weight so that my gut doesn't jiggle when I brush my teeth. I can relate. Um, the next one, I need to start eating more healthy, but first I need to eat all the junk food in the house so it's not there to tempt me anymore. That might be a good idea for some. The next one, this is from 2012. Dear God, my prayer for 2012 is for a fat bank account and a thin body. Please don't mix these up like you did last year. <laughs> Amen. Um, the next one, this is a cartoon. What exactly is a New Year's resolution? It's a to-do list for the first week of January. Hopefully that you get that. And, 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 and of course, Calvin and Hobbes here. Resolutions, me, just what are you implying? What, or that I need to change? Well, buddy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfect the way I am. Oh, that's so sweet. He's yelling at him. You see the exclamation points? The tiger looks scared. Um, According to research done by Betterment.com, 45% of Americans make New Year's resolutions. But only about 8% actually achieve them. Sadly, 25% of these people don't make it past the first week. The top 10 resolutions they say for this upcoming year is save more money, get out of debt, get fit, lose weight, change job, career, quit smoking, give up alcohol, spend less time working, Spend more time with family and friends. Give up chocolate. You can if you want. M move house. <laughs> I saw that one. I thought, they want to physically move the house? That's great. New Year's resolution. Move house. That's good. That's actually one of them. But for the most part, resolutions are all about self-improvement. Physically, relationally, financially, it's about bettering ourselves. This research goes on and gives four things that prevent us from achieving our goals. And this is what they found. It says, number one, we overestimate our ability to make good decisions when under pressure. That might be one. Number two, it says, it's much easier being virtuous when thinking of the future. Number three, it says, human willpower is not a constant personality trait and fluctuates throughout the day. We wake up and have it by lunch, we're hungry, no, forget it, you know. Number four, our resolve, and that's what we're looking at here, weakens when emotion takes over. Resisting the candy aisle at the supermarket becomes difficult when we're hungry. You know, that kind of thing. But when it comes to be a follower of Christ, our resolution list could be a little bit different. We could have things because we're, we're spiritual. We could have things like improving our prayer lives. That'd be a good thing. Reading our Bible in a year or just once a year. Just one or passage a year. Um, helping other people. That might be good, right? You guys want to do that? Getting involved in church more. Everyone's hand needs to go up there. Just, yes, I do. Come on, everybody. My hand is lifted. I'm having fun. Get involved. There we go. So get involved in church more. Becoming a better steward. I know that's on everybody's top three list. Using a devotional. Just using one. doesn't matter what day it is. Just use it one time. Planting some seeds of faith, going on a mission trip, or bringing someone to church. That might be some, for the spiritual people, that might be some of our resolution lists. But no matter what list you go by, the truth is the same. And that's most everyone would like things to be a little bit different. 
We'd like to come through this next year thinking that change can happen, real change, long time change. That a new year can actually be a new year. I read an article yesterday when I was preparing for this about the latest Economist YouGov poll. Out of the, the people that they polled, it says 54% of the people called 2013 a bad year. 54%. And then it said this, another 15% called it a very bad year. So almost 70% of the people polled said they would like to forget 2013 ever happened. That's about uh, what they're saying. See, there are a lot of people all around the world who would like to think that there is hope for something more, something different. I can be better. Something can happen. The things I struggle with, I don't have to struggle with anymore. There has to be something there. The fact of the matter is that the reason why a lot of these things don't work and the reason why a lot of people don't see real change is because there is a tremendous lack of resolve. If you were to look that up, it means a firm, unwavering determination to do something. You can't have, you can't have a resolution without having um, resolve. This morning, we are going to look at a conversation Jesus has with another man about the change Jesus is looking for and the resolve it takes that is required. And we're going to look at this in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. So if you want to turn there in your tablet, in your Phone, I know all you next geners, you know, you have all that ready. Just turn your, your, your version app or get it out. Or if you actually have a Bible like this, Tom, I'm using this as a prop. You just ruined it, man. If you actually have, this is called the Bible and it has something called paper in it. and has words on it. Get that out anytime today, please. Or just, or, or on your phone is fine. But let's read it together. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to go ahead and start. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Uh, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their, their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Can we pray together this morning, church? Come on, just bow your head with me. Father God, we come, Lord, to hear from you. God, we are a room full of people who need change in some way, shape, or form. And God, we've come in here not just to hear from you, but God, to be changed and transformed by you. God, I pray through your word, and I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you show us today, Father, what real change is. And the change that needs to happen in our lives. And God, the resolve that needs to be there. The obstacles that we need to throw out of our lives, God, for us to be new. God, through your word, let it come out with power and authority. I pray for, Father, or, or for the agendas and the motives, Father, to be thrown out the door of this church right now. That we can all be on the same page, ready to hear from you with nothing getting in the way. God, we thank you for who you are. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're talking about a conversation here between Jesus and Nicodemus, and we're talking about resolve and change. It's a really interesting conversation here. But when reading this, there are two important things we have to take note of at the, at the very beginning of this passage that gives us an indication of the kind of resolve that, that Nicodemus had, or at this moment. And these two things are this. When Nicodemus approached Jesus is important. It says something. And the other thing is how Nicodemus addressed Jesus is important. It shows us, it reveals some things to us. So the first one, when Nicodemus approached Jesus says something. Now, it says in verse 1 and then the first part of verse 2 it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. 
It would be easy to overlook this detail and dismiss it as insignificant, but I believe it is really, really um, telling of where he was. Ask yourself, why would Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Maybe we should understand who he was, right? It says that that he was a a Pharisee. The Pharisees were a a Jewish uh, religious sect of people who made a great deal of studying the law. They were very, very or religious people. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, an elite group of community and religious leaders. So that's who he was, right? Which means he was more than likely well-respected and well-known. Later on in verse 10, Jesus refers to him as Israel's teacher. So he was prominent. Nicodemus was a prominent man. A man in his position would be, un, or would be an unlikely candidate for the position of a follower of Christ. What would people think if they found out that this prominent prominent Jewish leader was an admirer of the carpenter turned rabbi from a nothing town called Galilee? What would people think, right? At the very least, he would lose his position, he would lose his reputation, he would be criticized, as we'll see later. He came at night because no one would see. He could avoid awkward questions about where he was going. It more than likely wouldn't impact his job because nobody or would be there. And it could give him an out if it was going to cost him too much. See, when he approached Jesus, says something about his resolve to really, really see change. See, it's similar to our resolve. I want to be different. I want to see change. I want to see something new happen. But guess what? I am just not ready to lose everything for it. Right? Right? I want to be different. I want the worst part of who I am to be gone. But guess what? Let me see first if it's going to cost me too much. Let me see first if I have to give up too much of myself. Or am I going to have to change? Is there going to be major change? Or is it going to be a complete overhaul of my life, of my heart? If so, then then, then I'm going to stay. I'm going to be a casual observer. And I'm going to stand back. I'm going to come at the point in my relationship with Christ that's the most... I'm comfortable where I don't have to give up much. So I'm going to come to him at night. Some of us in this room, we still come to him at night. Where maybe we don't have to change. Maybe people outside of this, this room can see us just as the person we were 15 years ago. But guess what? God is ready for a miraculous, radical revolution of our lives. He's ready to see us be turned upside down. So it's a matter of his resolve. The second thing, how how Nicodemus addresses Jesus reveals something here. John 3, 2 says, Rabbi, this is what Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, but no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus, he starts out with a flattering gesture by calling him rabbi and then proceeds to explain that he has come to a point of at least belief that Jesus is a teacher. Okay, that's the point of his belief at this moment. So you could say that Nicodemus has become somewhat of a fan. A fan, if you, or if you look it up, is an ardent admirer or enthusiast. Or Nicodemus saw something, he, you know, he had been around, he had seen or some miracles, he had seen some or amazing things happen, enough that he said, okay, I know this much by what you are doing in the people. I know this much. You are at least a teacher who God is with. You know, he wasn't going to go as far as saying you are or the son of God, but he was saying, okay, you know, just me c- coming to you is a big deal, and I want to give you this much. You are at least a teacher, and God has to be with you because all the miraculous things you are doing, I can't deny it anymore. So he has gained some knowledge. He has looked at Jesus and he has gathered information and said, okay, I at least know this. You are a teacher. See, I have gained information about Tiger Woods. I know just by the information, just by things I see on ESPN or whatever, that he is kind of good at golf. I know that, that, that Tiger is, his, is his, his nickname. Yay. His name is Eldrick or something. I'd want Tiger to be my nickname as well. At the age of eight, eight years old, he won his first international junior world title at eight. The first of six. 
1996, Tiger Woods won his first PGA Tour uh, victory. He was 21 years old when he won his first Masters big tournament, becoming the youngest player to ever win that, also becoming the first person of African or Asian uh, descent to win a major golf um, championship. In 2000, he won the British Open. In the year 2000, he broke the scoring record in three of the four major tournaments. Since then, he has entered 325 total tournaments, winning 98 times. 72 of those are PGA Tour victories, third place all time. 14 of those are major victories, second place, for a combined total of $115,618,045. I, I, I've gained a lot of information. But that doesn't mean I know him at all. See, we, we can gain a lot of information. Even if you aren't a believer, you could read through this book and maybe, or you know, the, the accuracy of this book. And you could gain, okay, Jesus was this, he did this, he did all these things. Man, that might be able to happen. I am at least a fan, I am at, or I'm at least come to a point of belief that he is Jesus. But that doesn't mean we have a relationship or we even want one because we just have information. I know Jesus, I know he healed people. We all know that. Guess what? Satan knows that. That doesn't mean we have a relationship. That doesn't mean changes really happen. How we approach him, when we, you know, how we address him. A relationship with God is a lot more, a relationship with Jesus is a lot more than just facts and figures and knowing things. I know by all the information I have gathered that I'm out of shape and need to lose a few pounds. That's where I'm at. I know this by how bad I hurt when I sit in a certain position on the floor. When I was younger and I was in shape, I could sit anyway. I could sit Indian style, and, you know, just fine, you know, getting, getting there. I could sit, you know, kind of, or like this, you know, on my heels, and I mean, just get up, you know, just, this is how, this is just, you know, regular or for me. But I've realized how much things change when it takes me 15 minutes and a bottle of aspirin just to get up. Something's got to change here for me. I know this by how out of breath I am to run five yards to get my mail. Hey, honey, I'm going to get the mail. Let me stretch for about 15 minutes first. I got to do calisthenics. I got to get limber. I'm, if I'm just going to make it out or to the road, I know things are changing in me where I, that, that's a hard thing. When I try to get out of getting the mail and I send my kids to do it, something's happening. You know? I know how hard it is to get on some older pair of jeans. <laughs> I'm good. I, I know that, that some things have to change personally because I've gathered that information. But that doesn't mean I have the resolve to do what it actually takes for it to change. Nicodemus had all this information. He knew about Christ enough to come to him at night to maybe get a glimpse a little more of who this man was. Maybe he's like, okay, you know, I can't deny it. I know all my peers, you know, those on the Jewish council, they might not believe, but I'm at least going to come to him at night so I can see a little bit more about this guy. I don't know if I want to change yet. I don't know how it's going to happen in my life, but I just want to know. And this is the measure of our resolve. We all have something that, that needs to change. Don't we? Stand up if you're perfect today. Oh, wait, I'm standing. Right? So something needs to change, right? We're all sinners. Tom. Right? So something needs to change, but do we have it within ourselves in firm and unwavering determination to actually see it happen? We need to change. That was the whole point of Jesus' conversation here. Jesus desired something different for Nicodemus. What Jesus desired for, or for him is found in verse 3, and it's repeated twice more in these first eight verses here. We read at the beginning, and it's this. It's in John 3, 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. No one. 
So he isn't beating around the bush here. Jesus wanted to get right to the point. Jesus wanted to push beyond all the courteous exchanges and push them aside and get right to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is this, that Nicodemus was seeking further instruction on how to really live. And in one sentence, Jesus sweeps away all that Nicodemus stood for and demands that he be made new. The path to real living is what Jesus was, you know, was saying is, is, is through, being born, uh, through being born again. Born in this verse literally means bring into being. That's the word there. And again is the Greek word anothen. It means from above or implying from heaven. So what he was saying and what he was getting at was that anyone who would enter the kingdom of God must come into being into a radically new fashion. With your manner of thinking, feeling, and acting undergoing a permanent revolution. How many of us need that? How many of us this morning, we need our thinking to truly be revolutionized? Oh, I do. How many of us this morning, we need our feelings to be completely revolutionized? Not a lot of takers on that one. How about just how we behave and, and how we act? I'll just, I'll just move on. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This kind of change that Jesus Desired can't happen by, near, by mere knowledge or the gaining of facts. It can only occur through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the change. And it's there. It's right there. Jesus got right to the point and said, Okay, I know why or you're coming, but here's really what you seek. Here is really what you need. You need to begin life anew. Completely revolutionized, transformed. You need to be a new creation. You got to get rid of some of your old, you know, religious stuff. You got to be new. See, because here's what happens for a, a lot of us is we focus a lot of times on the symptoms of our lives. Right? I can make myself a list of rules on what I need to do to get healthy or how to use my money right or how to get out of debt. But really what needs to happen is I need a complete lifestyle change for that thing to ever happen the way it's supposed to happen. I can try diet after diet. I can go through financial plan after financial plan. I can read every single relationship book that is out there. But until I let Jesus completely overhaul my life, lasting change will not be seen. That's where we are at. I've read a lot of books on some things. I've, you know, I have notes upon notes upon notes upon notes. But that doesn't mean I live that way how I need, you know, or how I read it. Until it changes right here. You know, you can go through all these resolution lists, and they're all just kind of the surface things, aren't they? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this different, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend money different. Well, guess what? If if this actually changed and you started listening to God about how to use your money, you would probably spend differently. You know, I last January. I said, you know what, I need to lose, I need to lose about 15 pounds. So I got my Wii out, you know, little thing, and I, I, I started doing this, this Wii Fit thing, just, just every day, running and eating, counting all my stuff, and, and man, it worked. First four or five months, I, I lost weight. I'm like, yes, yes, awesome. And then something happened about June or July, went on vacation, and I ate really good really good I was in Maine had lobsters like it's like they're they literally give lobster away I'm like oh you give me all this I can get right I'm cracking it open at the bib on I'm real happy eating away I'm eating everything that I can it's delicious a couple months later I, I I'm finding out man you know I'm just gonna keep on doing what I'm doing I'm not gaining you know a lot back I'm just gonna and and now here I am again I guess one of the things on my list is I need to lose about 15 pounds 
Why? Because it's not a lifestyle change. It's a do or a don't. It's a rule or a regulation. Really, for what I need is to change my mindset, change my life, change how I put out my effort to do things that really need to be different in my life. What we need as a church in America today is a complete lifestyle change. That is when lost and dying world will look at the church and truly believe that we believe. Right? I told you this is going to be so much fun. Most of us don't mind Jesus making some minor changes in our lives, but just like uh, Nicodemus, Jesus wants to turn our lives upside down. You know, change this. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll quit listening more to that, but I don't want to give up everything. Oh, I'll quit watching this, but man, you know what? Some things are just fun. Oh, I'll do this and that. You know, change me a little bit, but I don't want to completely change. I'm afraid of who I'll be. Have you said that? <laughs> I think for this upcoming new year, we really need to become new. I mean, it's that simple. I resolve to become new. But just like Nicodemus, do we have the resolve that is needed? Do you this morning have a firm and unwavering de determination to really see change happen? Fortunately for Nicodemus, this is not where his story ends. You fast forward a, a little bit to John 7, uh, 51, and we hear a little bit more about him. It says... Jesus, um, or popularity, or was growing, and the Sanhedrin meets together to find a way to silence him. But Nicodemus speaks up. Okay, we start to see what, or what he's all about. He speaks up in front of all the other ruling uh, members in John 7, uh, 51. About 70 to 71 of them. He speaks up in front of his peers, defending Jesus by saying, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? So this is it. He's saying, Okay. I can't hide it anymore. I'm going to start to really show what's going on in my life. He risks his career, his reputation, and publicly speaks up on behalf of Jesus in that passage. So much so, but what is their accusation? Or they say, oh, you must be a man of Galilee too. So this is my criticism of you. I'm going to attack you because you are starting to change. We then get another brief uh, mention of Nicodemus in John 19. Jesus has been crucified and his body was being prepared for burial. And we read in John 19, uh, 39 that Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. This was an unbelievably costly gesture that probably cost him more than just money. See, when others had abandoned Jesus, Nicodemus steps forward, makes this great gesture of affection and devotion. There was no more hiding what was going on. The change in his resolve helped him move past facts and knowledge and belief expressed in the darkness of night. His firm, unwavering determination more than likely allowed him to truly change. What is the end of your story this morning going to look like? What is the end of your 2013 going to be? The only hope for this upcoming year, the only hope or for the next day is for us to be truly different. The only hope for 2014 to be different is for us to end 2013 by being transformed completely and wholly by the power of God. Come this morning. Well, I, there's one more image, I think, Jacob. Uh, put that up there. Or that I say before the end here. I found this online. It says, today we start a new chapter in our life. 365 blank pages. We decide what goes in them. So fill them to make it the best chapter ever. I'm going to have the worship team come this morning if you can. Shannon, the team. The altar workers, you can go ahead and make your way up as well. And get out of a spot where people can see you. We're going to get at the heart uh, of the, the matter here. 
And this says it so perfectly. 365 pages, that's this next moment. We decide what goes in them. So fill them to make it the best chapter ever. How many of you are ready to fill it with the best, ch- the best days? How many of you are, are saying this morning, Steve, I want to change. I want to change exactly like what it says here. Complete overhaul of my life. Becoming a new thing. Beginning life anew. That's what I want. By the power of God, I want things that I've not been able to shed to fall off of me. Chains that have been on my life to be broken and set on the ground. I want to believe, or, or what it says in that song earlier, that the enemy is under our feet. How many of you want that change to happen? What we're going to do this morning is we're going to pray for resolve. We're going to pray for change in your life. And what we're going to do is just like, it's just like Nicodemus here. We, we, we can't just kind of sit in our pew and, and, and come to Jesus as night. It's time that we walk into the light. So I want everybody to stand this morning. They're going to start playing. Play whatever you guys decide to, but Shannon, go ahead and play something. We have plenty of time here. Let's make this sanctuary, or this morning, a church of change. If you felt like during any point in this message, oh, Steve, man, you are reading my book. There's things that I want to change, but I've never been able to change, and I need to change. Oh, man, but come on, get up here at this altar and let's change. Come on, don't just wait. Don't just wait, just get out, come forward, say, I'm ready. I'm ready for things to be out of my life. I'm ready for change. I'm ready to just come into being a brand new creation of God. I'm ready for this change. I'm ready for something new to occur. I'm ready to believe a new way. I'm ready for my my thoughts and my feelings and my actions to be new. I am ready to be new. Come on. Are you ready? Don't be... How, don't be how I was last year, ready to change a little bit, but not having the resolve to completely see something long-term happen. It's time that we change in the long term. It's time or that we get beyond the symptoms and go to the heart of really what ails us. And that is an overhaul of the heart. Come on, come up. As you come this morning, somebody's going to come, they're going to lay hands on you, and they're going to pray over you, and I just, I just ask that you just let the Holy Spirit do work. We're going to sing a, a few times, and I just, if, if, if at any point, even during this song, even during this chorus, that you need to get out, I urge you, be obedient to the Holy Spirit, come forward, seek change this morning. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hope of the world lifted on high, calling us home.
this morning, just lift up your hands across this place. If you're praying, just pray. But come on, or let's enter in. Father God, we need you this morning. For radical change, we need you. For the change that is lasting, God, for the change that is deep and that's beyond symptoms, we need you. Father, as we said at the beginning of the service, God, we want to leave here different than how we came into this place. God, we want to start 2014 different, God, than what we did last year. God, and we want to be new. We want to come into being, Father, radically changed. Wholly, completely following you. Do that work, God, right now. Do that work, Father, right now in this place. Hallelujah. God, I pray for those here at this altar. God, I know you are revealing things to them, God, maybe deep things. God, I pray right now that you do a work within them, God. Change them. Free them. Rescue them, God, right now. And for this church, God, I pray for change to happen in this church. God, maybe to allow us to do things we have never, ever done before. Do a work right now, God, in us all, in this room. God, we praise your name right now for what you are doing. We worship you and we praise your name, God. Have your way in this room, Father. Have your way in this room. Do a work, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue to pray. For those at the altar, they're going to be here until they, they feel released by God. We're going to keep on singing, but if you need to go this morning... God bless you. We love you. We just ask you quietly just slip out the back and let those at the altar just continue to feel free to be up there. Amen. God bless you all today.